Live from Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York, I'm Kaylee Lyons. And I'm Shanali Basic. Stepping in for Matt Miller, welcome to Bloomberg Crypto. It's a look at the people, the transactions, and the technology shaping the world of decentralized finance. All right, coming up, prices across digital assets have surged since the start of the year, but Bitcoin is fumbling today. Is it too early to declare the crypto winter over? We'll discuss with Greg King of Osprey Funds. And the industry, it's got a hacking problem. We're gonna talk to Aaron Plant of Chainalysis, who brings us a special report on how thieves stole a record $3.8 billion worth of digital money in 2022. And move over crypto, booze is back. We'll have details on the advertising turnover in Sunday's big game. And I personally cannot wait until Super Bowl Sunday, but first we have to get through this Wednesday session and the few days uh, to follow that. And what you will see is on this Wednesday, pull up CRYP Go on your Bloomberg terminal. You will see that the biggest digital coins, Bitcoin, Ether, are both down on the day in tandem with risk assets like equities, each down uh, the better part of 1%. Bitcoin right now is hovering right around that $23,000 level. It is actually some of the altcoins that are outperforming. Tron up 2% on the day and Polygon up another near 6% today at 132 and change Shanali. Polygon's already up 74% on a year-to-date basis. Let's talk about those altcoins a little bit more because there was some skepticism. Bitcoin was the king in town. Bitcoin is this line in yellow, Kaylee. And yes, it has had a rebound a bit this year so far. It's early in the year. But take a look. Polygon is just blowing through the roof compared to Bitcoin. When you look at the percentage gain, it is a smaller token than Bitcoin is. So, of course, uh, percentage gains would be bigger on that scale. But you also have Solana, which has doubled since the beginning of the year. There was a lot of skepticism. So let's talk a little bit more about some of this optimism because there's micro strategy. Of course, one of the biggest Bitcoin believers, they have posted their eighth consecutive quarterly loss after writing down the value of its crypto holdings. But it doesn't stop Michael Saylor from planning on doubling down in different ways on his bet on Bitcoin. He spoke to Bloomberg earlier this week. So Bitcoin's 5x the S&P. It's more than 10x NASDAQ returns. Gold's down 5 or 6 percent. Silver and bonds are down 15 to 20 percent. Mm -hmm. So the very simple strategy is we just hold the Bitcoin forever and we expect it to outperform other asset classes. All right, so let's break down the resurgence in digital assets like Bitcoin a little bit further. Vildana, Vildana Hyrick is joining us now. Vildana, we are starting to see some patterns coming back in that you're seeing more moves on the weekends. Also, just in general, trading volumes coming back. Yeah, we are seeing trading volumes coming back. It's coming alongside of this resurgence that we've seen in crypto prices. But the weekend thing is really fascinating to me because we know cryptocurrencies trade around the clock, 24-7. They never take a day off. And so seeing Bitcoin and some other tokens posting huge pops over the weekends is just really, really interesting. There actually is no consensus on why it might be happening, but you have analysts saying things like, Trading volumes tend to be just thinner over the weekend, so potentially moves can be a lot larger, even if you have some trading going on. And then also you have what in traditional markets we call the overnight effect, where just a ton of news tends to come out, companies post news, data comes out, things that people would want to be trading on. And so when you have that coming, for example, on a Friday night or on a Saturday, you have people trading around the clock and you can see these wild moves on weekends. And the wild moves, we were talking about the altcoins, that doubling of Solana this year, that 75% jump in Polygon. Where's the negativity? There is still a spate of crypto bankruptcies that are going through separate processes. People are not getting all their money back 100 cents on the dollar. So why are people so optimistic? Is it just that things have sold off so much? If there's one thing in crypto, it's that there's never-ending optimism. So you have Michael Saylor saying that crypto prices can recover. Within the crypto space, traditionally, you'll be seeing people saying and making those types of predictions just because you sort of need to have this optimism to be hanging on through what we refer to as the crypto winter, where prices just had sold off just tremendously. And you just want people looking forward and looking ahead and looking at potentially new projects but we have to go back to what's happening in traditional markets, which is that stocks are rallying. You have sort of like a comeback of retail investors. You have a meme stock resurgence, Bed Bath & Beyond, yeah. all of the craziness <laughs> that's going on over there. You are also seeing this resurgence in crypto prices. And I really do think we have to keep that in mind when we're thinking about these huge rallies. Well, and these big inflows as well. I mean, is that realistically what we can chalk this up to, just that those animal spirits seem to be back? I think the most interesting thing about that is 
that we saw this resurgence in prices in January. So we had Bitcoin rallying something like 40%, Ether also rallying something like 40%. And then when you're looking at flows for ETNs, for exchange traded products that are linked to cryptocurrencies, you're actually seeing the follow through where investors are putting money into some of these products. They're not just watching the prices rallying. So we, in January, saw something like $210 million coming into these uh, cryptocurrency exchange traded products, which was the most in a really long time, especially considering the crypto winter that we've been seeing. And so, yeah, you are just watching investors actually putting money in and not just sitting on the sidelines. All right, Vildana, we have to leave it there. But thank you so much for joining us, as always. That was Bloomberg's Vildana Hyrick. All right, well, joining us now to discuss further is Greg King. He is the CEO of Digital Asset Manager Osprey Funds, which, of course, operates OBTC. Greg, thank you so much for joining us from what looks like a very beautiful Florida. I'm very jealous yeah. sitting here in New York. If we first could just talk about this kind of price action conversation we were just having with Vildana, mm. how sustainable do you think the rally we have seen in 2023 actually is? We think we've, we've hit the bottom. You know, I wouldn't be surprised to see a little bit of churn as it goes, uh, as the year progresses. You know, people are looking at the macro environment. Obviously, Vildana mentioned a number of things, uh, the Fed probably being being paramount. But um, I think you also, you know, suggested that have things sold off so much that, that really that's just a big part of it. And I think, yes, you know, those of us who have been involved in, in crypto uh, for a long time, are, are kind of getting used to this. And, um, you know, there's been some research put out that every downdraft is, is sort of slightly less than the previous one. Um, so if that's the case this time, then we've bottomed out. But I don't think it's a straight line up from here. Um, I do think the optimism translates into perhaps climbing the wall of worry, uh, which is a good thing. We can handle that. That's okay. Mm -hmm. Sometimes a slower move up is better. Hey, Greg, I mean, clearly you're also looking to make moves of your own in the industry. You're one of the players here that want to take over the sponsorship of the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust. I'm curious as to, A, why you want to do this, and B, this proposal of r reducing the fees associated with that trust, the conversations you might be having on the sides with other investors. Look, at a high level, 2022 was not good. For crypto, right? Everyone focuses on the price action, but really, I think we lost a lot of trust in the from the investing public. Uh, you know, people blew up. Uh, there may have been illegal activities. You know, we, we've all been watching this um, drama unfold, and so towards the end of the year, we just felt we needed to to do something. And there's a lot of investor angst in our particular sector around secondary market prices and and things like that. So we're taking steps that we think will help to at least address what we can, um, which is taking care of our Bitcoin investors, trying to do uh, the right thing, price things responsibly and, and, and manage the funds as best we can in a volatile uh, market. You know, we take uh, a different view from other players in the market as to what's possible or what requires SEC uh, exemptions and things like that. And so, um, you know, our goal is to just uh, let our actions speak louder than our words and, and really execute in what we think is the best interest of investors. Speaking of trading, on one hand, you have that NAV really kind of coming in. People have been buying, buying into the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust, given how much it had sold off. But one of the big sellers, according to the Financial Times, was DCG, apparently selling mm -hmm. shares of the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust. What do you make of that as a market participant? <laughs> As a market participant, I mean, look, I think that's very uh, tricky territory. We don't hold, uh, you know, our Osprey doesn't hold positions in its own its own fund or, or have a parent company type of situation where there's a lot of, um, you know, cross currents. So I, I can't really speak to the specifics of that. I don't I don't even know if that's necessarily true or not. Um, you know, I follow along, but I don't, you know, have, uh, you know, direct knowledge of, of the situation. I think just generally what investors are looking for is, hey, you know, a lot of Bad stuff has gone on this year. We're trying to sift through, you know, who are the who are the people that, and institutions that we can trust. You know, what's real and what's not real in crypto. And I think that those of us who come from a tradfi background really understand investor mindsets. Um, whereas there's a lot of kind of a uh, techie mindset in crypto of moving fast and breaking things. And unfortunately, I think a lot of that got washed out in 2022. I mean, it's unfortunate in one sense, but it's also a good thing. It needed to happen, and so we're still seeing some of that. Uh, you know topple into 2023. But I'm optimistic. I think this is a cleansing that's that was needed. I think that uh, the industry will emerge um, stronger 
and we'll, you know, we'll forge a path forward. Hopefully Congress, mm -hmm. you know, makes some kind of movement and, uh, you know, gets their act together to, to help provide some clarity because we do think that's a major issue. Well, I'm glad you kind of brought up those regulatory issues, Greg, because that's another headwind that this industry has to contend with. And on the subject of regulation, mm -hmm. there is the issue of a spot ETF and obviously GPTC, the attempt to convert into an ETF, a fight, by the way, that they are still fighting. I know you filed a lawsuit last month essentially alleging that Grayscale had misrepresented the likelihood of that ETF conversion actually happening. Can you just walk me through your argument there when you also are still trying to work with regulators and make that ETF happen? Isn't this a regulatory problem? Yeah, there's actually a lot of, of moving parts here. Um, uh, we do have a lawsuit uh, that, that, that's out there. I, I have to point people to the materials themselves. I can't really comment on the particulars there. But um, I think taking a step back, um, you know, various investors have or various uh, actors in the market have, I think, damaged the industry in various ways, right? We're trying to do our best to rectify that in whatever way we can. Some actions out there impacted the, the ecosystem overall. Some impacted us directly and our, and our clients directly. So we want to rectify that. And um, we're taking steps both with our own fund and, um, you know, in, in the industry to try and make sure that justice is served. Okay, but if you could put a likelihood or a probability around that spot ETF actually one day coming to fruition, being realized, what, yeah. what, what would that probability look like? I mean, I wish I had a number for you because I like numbers, but, um, you know, based on our discussions with the SEC, um, you know, I, I personally don't understand the, the holdups at this point. I think they could easily see their way clear to rationally and logically approving the ETF, but I'm not sure that that's going to happen. And I'm not sure I understand um, all of the um, interests that, that go into making that decision to stay put, right? It may not be as simple as just the Bitcoin ETF uh, itself. I mean, I think there's broader considerations that involve, you know, the, the whole of crypto. I mean, we, you know, we're focused on this narrow piece and it'd be great to solve this problem. Um, but, you know, Congress and the SEC, I mean, they're thinking about much broader issues, whether it's stable coins or whether it's, uh, you know, online lending programs. I mean, they have a lot of considerations. And so um, I don't I don't know what they are thinking with respect to how you know, approving this thing over here might affect that thing over there. And so I think it's all uh, tied together, unfortunately, because I do think the spot Bitcoin ETF would solve a lot of the issues that investors are facing. And it would have uh, avoided a lot of the problems that came up when there was only mainly one instrument to trade and mm -hmm. lots of arbitrage and lending and all kinds of things. So, uh, you know, it'd be great to fix this. I'm just not convinced uh, it's happening anytime soon. All right, and we will leave it on that note. Greg King of Austri Funds, thank you so much for your time. Now, coming up, we're going to turn to hacking and security concerns in the DeFi space. Aaron Plant, Plant Vice President of Investigations at Chainalysis, will join us. And one thing that will be missing from the Sunday Super Bowl that Kaylee and I will be very upset about, it's crypto <laughs> ads. More Sunday's big game ahead. You should probably better watch it. And to access all of the latest data and news on crypto, check out CRYP Go on the terminal. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Crypto. I'm Shanali Basic with Kaylee Lines. Thieves stole a record $3.8 billion worth of cryptocurrency in 2022, up from $3.3 billion the previous year. And that's according to a report published by blockchain data firm Chainalysis. The report found that the surge in crypto theft has been driven by North Korean hackers in the face of international sanctions. The vast majority of the hacks targeted DeFi protocols in a blow to decentralized finance. More than 82% of the hack victims were DeFi protocols, with many cross-chain bridges being targeted specifically. They're the protocols that let crypto users move from one blockchain to another. So to talk more about this now is Erin Plant. She's the vice president of investigations at Chainalysis. Erin, thank you so much for joining us. We're talking about DeFi being the bulk of the issue here when you're looking at hackers targeting certain protocols. But what does this mean for DeFi moving forward? Does the industry have a shot at turning this trajectory around? It does, it does. Uh, the, the targeting of DeFi is inevitable of new technology and new innovations 
there's an increased focus as these attacks have increased on cybersecurity at the, the front end to stop the attacks altogether. There's a, a lot of um, effort from cybersecurity companies in the, in the private sector as well as public sector agencies around the world to, to tackle the front end attacks of these DeFi platforms. And there, there's also the downstream efforts that are occurring for the, the money laundering itself. Because if you could stop North Korea in particular from cashing out the funds, it, it reduces the threat quite a bit. Well, let's talk about North Korea then further. How much can that be blamed for the uptick we saw in 2022? And do we expect that that's a pattern that's going to continue? Yeah, so the increase in stolen funds by North Korea is about fourfold what it was the previous year. So they, they made off with, with about $1.7 billion. So it's a significant amount of those stolen $3.8 billion. And as research has showed, it's it's the money is being used to fund their missiles program. So it's a national security threat around the world. Uh, the, the public and private partnerships in this space is, is key. Uh, a lot of that $1.7 billion is still sitting on chain. So we are actively working with agencies around the world to freeze portions of that funds whenever possible. Um, we, we work really closely with the NCSC within the uh, Korean National Intelligence Service mm -hmm. and just last week, we worked together to trace over a million dollars of DPRK stolen funds to a USDC wallet. And working together with our law enforcement partners as well, we were able to get that one blacklisted. So there are significant efforts in this space. And I, I really believe that the, the primary way that we're going to stop North Korea from stealing funds is to make it less lucrative for them. And as much of these 1.7 billion that we can seize back from them before they're able to convert it to fiat is really, really important. You know, given the sheer number of attacks that are coming from North Korea and the amount that it has led to an amount of, you know, money being stole through the crypto ecosystem, what sets the North Korean hackers apart from other types of hackers? Are there ways that it's more or less difficult to track down the money or even retrieve it in any case? They're extremely sophisticated, both in their attack vectors as well as their money laundering. So they really attack crypto platforms from all possible angles. They leverage sort of age old hacking tactics of malware and phishing, but they also have become very sophisticated in um, code exploits where they actually find vulnerabilities within the code of DeFi platforms and they exploit that code directly within the smart contracts to make off with funds from those protocols. So they are evolving as the technology evolves. And um, from the money laundering perspective, they are one of the most sophisticated launderers that we ever come up against. They use every possible mechanism of obfuscation from mixers to um, you know, chain hopping to, to really any, um, any tool that's out there. And they're continuing to evolve their tactics. Each time there's a sanction or an event that occurs, mm -hmm. um, they change their their tactics for money laundering. So they're they're very sophisticated. It's been very profitable for them. They've they've made a lot of money. Yeah. When you compare the amount that they've stolen with the amount that they bring in through through legitimate enterprises, mm -hmm. it's a significant amount. So they're clearly putting a heavy investment on on this hacking effort. OK, so if you were dealing with such a sophisticated perpetrator in many cases, what can an individual crypto investor do to protect themselves? Yeah, so um, protecting yourself is, um, you know, not not um, not clicking on emails that are, are phishing in nature. So you can protect your personal uh, wallets from those types of attacks. Um, the, the DeFi platforms and the crypto platforms as well, uh, increasing the, the effort on cybersecurity. Um, and as it relates to the code exploits, increasing the effort on having code audited and um, increasing those efforts at the front end where the attack vectors are occurring. Um, and then also the, the regulators, you know, the, the increased focus on regulators and uh, law enforcement to uh, sanction tools that are being used as money laundering is really important because it does stop those funds from having that avenue to launder, um, as well as the places where 
uh, the cryptocurrency is being cashed out fiat currency. There's a um, you know, significant effort from the, the private sector to, to focus on that as well. Aaron Plant, thank you so much for your analysis. That's Aaron Plant of Chain Analysis. Thank you so much for your time. And we will, uh, you know, move on to Bloomberg Crypto's podcast as well. If you love the show, you'll love the podcast. It dives deeper into the daily market buzz. Explore the stories and people shaping the ever-evolving digital landscape. Look for that every weekday wherever you get your podcasts. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Crypto. I'm Kaylee Lyons with Shanali Bosick. Now to some crypto stories that caught our attention this week, and it's a potential resolution to one of crypto's biggest bankruptcies. After a months-long impasse, an agreement has been reached in the spat between crypto billionaires Cameron and Tyle Winklevoss and digital currency groups Barry Silbert. The plan includes DCG restructuring some of its debt and contributing equity interest. And then there are the crypto companies which are continuing to shed workers. In just the first five weeks of this year, the number of losses in the industry has grown into the thousands. The biggest cuts are coming from Crypto.com, Coinbase, and Kraken. And finally, last year's Crypto Bowl will not be getting a second showing. After a flood of commercials during 2022's game, the crypto industry will be absent from this year's Super Bowl broadcast. Alcohol ads instead will be filling the void after Budweiser gave up its rights as the exclusive alcohol brand. And Shanali, as a sports fan, you know I have extra interest in this story, but it really will be so different to not see Larry David in an FTX commercial or really just any exchange advertising. According to Media Radar, there was $54 million worth of crypto Super Bowl ads last year. It's going to be zero this year in the wake of FTX's collapse. So we have to miss Tom Brady as well yes. as all the crypto companies Which I will not well complain when about. it comes to the NFL. You know, I have got to say, I miss the Budweiser puppy more than I do <laughs> the crypto commercials. But interestingly, you know, when I was down in Miami, Coinbase was still sponsoring tons of stuff when you were looking at the industry overall. So it's not like the ads are gone. They're just not at the Super Bowl. It's a little bit of a pullback. And of course, that's evidenced as well by the job cuts you were mentioning. After balling out, spending big when it was boom time, it's very different for a lot of these companies now, and they have to pull back. All right, that's going to wrap it up for Shanali and I this week. Thank you so much for stepping in for Matt Miller. And coming up, this show will be back on Tuesday at 1 p.m. next week. We'll be speaking with the Hut 8 Mining CEO, Jamie Leverton, and the CEO of Fireblocks. This is Bloomberg. <laughs>